And we're back. So after further review with my executive producer, it's probably not in my best interest to actually read the passage from this great book and have our co-host and author read. So we will be, um, we'll have David read from his new book, The United States of War. And I'm just going to set this up real quick. Um, David made a trip to Guantanamo Bay where um, he was doing research for his book. And he's describing the scene in this, in this chapter here. So David, if you would do me the honor. My honor, my pleasure. The most well-known and notorious of US bases overseas, the Guantanamo Bay Naval Station, makes most people think of its high security prison created by the George W. Bush, Dick Cheney administration in 2002. After the administration launched its so-called global war on terrorism, the prison became an international symbol of the administration's policies of brutal torture and indefinite detention without trial. Since the emergence of images of orange jumpsuit clad prisoners being held in what were initially outdoor prisons, the facility has imprisoned around 780 individuals aged 13 to 98. Most were guilty of nothing more than being in the wrong place at the wrong time. More than 85% of about 700 detainees transferred out of the prison were not suspected of committing terrorist acts. To the surprise of many, the prison occupies a tiny corner of the base. While some may know of the base's undulating fence line walling off the rest of Cuba, as seen in the Jack Nicholson movie, A Few Good Men, Few have seen the vast majority of the base. Ironically enough, it offers a good picture of bases worldwide. Like most bases, Gitmo resembles a US town, in this case, plopped down on the Cuban coast. Since at least the 1950s, military leaders have designed most bases abroad to look something like idealized versions of suburbia. Gitmo, like many other bases, features suburban style housing development with names like Deer Point and Villa Mar. They have wide looping roads and cul-de-sacs lined with single family homes featuring driveways, garages, and spacious backyards dotted with grills and play toys. Almost everywhere, teams of workers, often low paid Filipinos, keep expansive lawns meticulously groomed. Using racialized language reflecting the racial hierarchy on base and the racial organization of labor, some military personnel call these men lawn ninjas. Most bases like Gitmo have schools, hospitals, movie theaters, gyms, golf courses, yoga studios, bowling alleys, entertainment centers, fast food and other restaurants, barber and beauty shops, post offices, chapels, and other places of worship. Along the main two lane road through the center of base known as downtown, a sun bleached set of McDonald's golden arches stands above most of Gitmo's landscape. The McDonald's, along with other shops and stores, violates the ban on commercial activities in the original base agree agreement with the Cuban government. Like many bases, Guantanamo Bay is on prime waterfront property, meaning the base enjoys gorgeous, uncrowded Caribbean beaches. Wow. David. That passage there was so descriptive of what the base was like. I have to tell you, when I read that, I shook my head the whole time and I had to read it over twice because I couldn't believe what I was reading, one. Because all I knew about Guantanamo Bay was the jail itself. That's all that I thought was there. I literally pictured it of how, how um, it was perceived and, and given to me as that it was a jail and it was like a desert. Nothing more, nothing less. So when I read that McDonald's was there and the cul-de-sacs, it really, it, it, it made me really angry. In the point of, again, you are on someone else's 
territory and you are leasing. I love how you brought in that fact in the book. You guys really need to read this book. Um, and definitely get David's other books. You really need to go out and purchase The United States of War by David Vine because I was so irate. How dare you go on someone else's property and make it what you want to? Um, having the McDonald's there when there's no other place outside of the base, correct me if I'm wrong, of any other McDonald's. How, how do you just come in and westernize something that's not yours, which was very disturbing to me. And just like you said, just like how Ecuador was like, hey, no problem. You can lease this again. But I just asked for one thing that we that we have a base over in Miami. And I know U.S. was like, oh, heck no. Why? Why? And why is what's good for the goose not good for the gander? So well put, so well put. And in many ways, Guantanamo Bay is, is the worst example because Guantanamo Bay exists without the consent at all of the Cuban government. The Cuban government, since the Cuban Revolution, and even before the Cuban Revolution, has been asking for Guantanamo Bay back. The United States imposed the quote unquote lease on the Cuban government shortly after the 1898 war between the United States and Spain wow. when the United States seized control of Guantanamo Bay. Other bases around the world, there's usually some degree of consent, some agreement where the local government gets something for turning over some of their territory for a base. It, um, makes, sense. it, make, it makes more sense. In, in many in many cases, these are undemocratic governments, so local people aren't necessarily so happy that their government has turned over their territory in exchange for whatever goodies they might have which received. Is, which is understandable. But Guantanamo Bay, is, it really took visiting Guantanamo Bay and probably even years after that, that I realized Guantanamo Bay is a colony. We don't hear it described that way often, but that's what it is. We, the United States government has colonized this territory that's, not, again, not so small. It's about the size of Washington, D.C. This is a very large wow. military base, as many of them are. And, you know, more broadly, my book tries to, uh, like military bases, cast some light on other homes to, to U U.S. military bases in what are the remaining U.S. colonies. Again, they now get talked about in terms of territories, but as many of the folks in, in, in Florida know, Puerto Rico does not have independence. It is not a state. People cannot vote for president. Puerto Rico is effectively a colony, as is Guam and the Northern Mariana Islands and American Samoa and the U.S. Mm -hmm. Virgin Islands. Mm -hmm. um, and in a different way, Washington, D.C. is one of the colonies as well. So there's actually a very close linkage between uh, the colonization of territory and the creation of military bases, as, as my book, The United States of War, tries to show. Wow. That is just so amazing. I, it was it was so hard to read some of this um, because of just the knowledge that we were we were gaining from this book. So, David, let let me let me talk about that. Um, we grew up here in the States glorifying war. Um, and I remember learning about Christopher Columbus, the Civil War and everything. And it's so crazy to me how some of these important factors were left out of, of the stories, you know, um, even... Even learning about Guantanamo Bay, all these all these different parts of the wars and things and, and what government does as policy has not been taught to us. And literally you went out and got this information. It it scares me to think what we actually don't know as citizens since we are of the people, for the people, by the people. It scares me how much we don't know what our government is doing and why they will not provide us this information and let 
the people make the decisions that we need to make for our own government. What's your take on that? I couldn't agree more. And in many ways, it was the story of the Chagosians, the people exiled from their homeland in, on Diego Garcia and the surrounding islands, the story that I knew nothing about, that most people in the United States knew nothing about, that, that uh, brought home for me the all that we don't know. And in many ways, the process of doing the research for that first book and, and, the, and the subsequent two books has been a process of, of educating myself, of trying to, as I said before, free myself from some of the mythologies that get told about the United States, from especially the glorification of war, the glorification that you know begins with uh, the glorification of Christopher Columbus, and mostly that uh, you know avoids any talk of the violence and the war that he inflicted on, on Native peoples after he arrived, uh, and then the glorification of, of wars from the Revolutionary War to the Civil War uh, mm -hmm. to World War II. And, and to the present. One, one of the other starting points behind the, the new book, The United States of War, mm -hmm. is, was my realization that the past 19 years since the attacks of 9-11, the past 19 years when the United States has been fighting war constantly, mm -hmm. actually, you know, part of me felt like, oh, this is strange, this is unusual. When I looked at it more carefully at the history, I realized this is actually the norm in U.S. history. It is. The the U.S. government, the U.S. military, they've been fighting wars almost constantly since U.S. independence. Yes. Um, by the count of, by my count, which draws on the work of the Congressional Research Service, the United States has been fighting a war or engaged in some other form of combat in every year of its existence except for 11 years. So that's about 95% of the years in U.S. history the United States military has been fighting a war or been involved in some other form of combat. Wow. So my basic question was, why? why? Why all these wars? What explains it? And does it have to be this way? Right. Do we have to be a United, States, a United States of war? Could we envision the United States in a different way, like you were saying, a, a country that would be of the people, by the people, a country where in a democratic fashion, we might decide on critical matters like war. And when yeah. so often it's been a small group of leaders, of elites who've decided to take the United States into war, sending other people, usually poorer folks, usually people of color, disproportionately, mm -hmm. have been the ones who've been sent off to go fight these wars, usually also against people of color, as we you know, can see yeah. clearly in the so history of US wars. Mm -hmm. This is what I wanted to investigate and try to understand and then try to do something about with my new book, The United States of War. I love it. I love it. David, let's go to page um, 311, where you actually put out a map that was very, very important for me. Um, and again, we, we've, we've kind of touched on it um, in our conversation already, but it's the how would you feel map? And here you actually draw out if, and I'm going to turn to that page right now, um, if the uh, Chinese and Iranian and North Korea and Russian bases was, were shown to be existing in areas around the United States, how would we as a people feel about that? So if we had the Chinese, the the Iranians, the North Koreans, and the Russians um, set up camp, just like we have at it's, it's several, several different co um, countries already, how would we feel um, and how would we react if, the surround, if we were surrounded by foreign bases near our borders? And it was just that, a wake-up call. It was just like the... the, the um, um, the Ecuadorians asking for them to set up in Miami. So I wanted, I know some people at first they're like, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of one of those people too. Listen, I want to feel safe. We're over there for a reason. 
And I get that, you know, we're over there. If we're, if we're there as allies to assist these other countries, I'm all for that. Understand that. I am for peace and whatever will bring peace, I will back. If it is that we're there aiding, we're allies, I'm fine with. If we are there for gain, and we all know what we're talking about, right? We're talking about, that's right, we are talking about those greens, those dollars. Oil, um, mining, we're looking at um, precious stones. If we're there for those reasons, I, as a citizen, cannot condone that at all because I don't see what the purpose is for any of that. And if it was the other way around, again, I couldn't, I wouldn't feel comfortable. Why is it is, is acceptable for us to do that? David, I, I, I really did love the imagery and I, I really do pray that people ask themselves those questions, that they really take a very good look at what we've been doing. As, as, a, as a government, because I say we because we are of the government too. So what we've been doing, why we've been silenced and why we don't know what's going on. I pray that you read this book to get a better understanding of what's going on in the world today. Thank you, David, so much for this. Um, before we close out this segment, do you have anything else you want to share about your book? United States of War. I couldn't have said it any better than you, but I just uh, to underline a, a couple of points, I, I think indeed the, the map, this sort of hypothetical map, there are no U.S., excuse me, there are no Chinese bases or Iranian bases or North Korean bases or Russian bases around U.S. borders. Mm -hmm. The map is trying to ask us to us in the United States to consider how would it feel again? How would it feel if there was even a single Chinese base or Russian base near the borders of the United States? Mm -hmm. okay. Meanwhile, ex exactly, precisely. And we would probably ask for some sort of military response. Yeah. We would probably say we need to protect ourselves more. Even if you know those Russian leaders or Chinese leaders said, oh, these are purely defensive. They're for the peace of, and, and good of the world and the yeah. globe. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what U.S. leaders have been saying since World War II. Meanwhile, literally hundreds of U.S. bases are surrounding Chinese borders, Russian borders, the borders of Iran, the borders of North Korea. And we shouldn't be surprised that people in those countries don't feel, don't feel, they, they feel threatened by these bases. Yeah. They don't feel yeah. put, put at ease um, and because we, I think we would feel the same way. Mm -hmm. And and that's why I, I think it's important, as, as you were saying, to, to look at, at, at what our government is doing with our taxpayer dollars around the world mm -hmm. uh, and, and what the effects are and whether we could be protecting ourselves in much more effective ways and much more yeah. cost effective ways as well. Yeah. Yes, because you did get into the numbers in your book on, on how much it costs and in, in, in on basis to even run them the way that they are. And I was astonished when definitely we are talking about um, that we don't have money for education, <laughs> you know, and how poverty stricken we have some states and, and areas and things. So it, it was really crazy for me to, to even see those numbers that you gave. Hey, guys, we are actually um, running out of time for this segment here. We'll be coming right back and we'll be discussing our new civil war. So you guys stay tuned.